Hi, I'm Shri Vibhani, and today on Raise the Line, I'm honored to be joined by Dr. Joshua Sharfstein, who is the Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Sharfstein has been leading, a leading force in public health and healthcare reform throughout his career, which includes serving as Principal Deputy Commissioner of the FDA in the Obama Administration, Secretary of the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and the Health Commissioner of Baltimore, Maryland. He's also the author of the book, The Public Health Crisis Survival Guide, Leadership and Management in Trying Times. So Dr. Sharfstein, thanks so much for being with us today. Sure. Thanks for having me. So <clears throat> we know a lot about your background, but for our listeners who may not have uh, be as well versed, I'm curious, would you mind giving us a bit more information about how you got into medicine and then have transitioned into all these major public health roles? Sure. Um, I'm a pediatrician, so I am... Um, I did my uh, medical school training and then pediatrics residency. I did a general uh, pediatrics fellowship where I worked on policy issues at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and the World Health Organization. And then I went to work for Congressman Henry Waxman on Capitol Hill. At that time, I was seeing patients um, still at Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C. and Mount Washington Pediatric Hospital up here in Baltimore. And uh, then after about five years, I applied to be the health commissioner in Baltimore, which at the time I told Congressman Waxman was a job I didn't want and I wouldn't get. And lo and behold, I wound up health commissioner, uh, which was really an amazing experience. Um, and I moved from there uh, to the administration and the first Obama administration at FDA, and then to the um, state health department in 2011. Um, and I've, been at, I've been at Johns Hopkins since 2015. And how did you choose to go into medicine in the first place, as well as a, a career in pediatrics? Sure. Um, well, uh, both of my parents are doctors. Um, and when I was uh, five, I was asked what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I apparently responded, do I have a choice? So I was the <laughs> oldest child and it's kind of a bit of an expectation. I, I didn't major in any of the pre-med subjects, though. And I just took the pre-meds on the side. And I was actually considering a career in political speech writing. That was like something I really loved doing. The only problem was I wasn't very good at it, I realized. Um, and uh, the last summer of college, uh, by day, I worked for a political consulting firm and I did get to do some speeches. And on the weekend, I was like assistant to the nurse's aide at DC General Hospital. And I found myself just riveted by what was going on at that hospital and looking forward to the weekend, even though we were just stocking shelves. And that really led me to decide to go to medical school. I took a year off after college and worked in Central America. I learned Spanish. I worked on vitamin A projects in Guatemala and helped a rural, uh, actually, I should say a urban kind of uh, one room clinic um, in, in San Jose, Costa Rica. And that you know, really solidified my desire to go into medicine. Wow, that's a great backstory. And uh, I think I was about five when my parents asked me the same thing. And my family, I'm, I'm sort of the black sheep in that my dad's a physician, my mom's a physical therapist, and my sister's a dentist. So we joked that between my entire family, we can treat anybody. Uh, but then I became obviously a tech, uh, tech entrepreneur. So, <laughs> um, you know, you've been doing a lot of work for, for years, obviously, in public health. And I'm curious, um, you know, you've written a bunch about how we can reform the healthcare system, make it more affordable and high quality. Um, would love to hear some of your thoughts as well as how COVID may be impacting either derailing those efforts or strengthening them uh, now. Well, you know, the U.S. healthcare system has its strengths and weaknesses. Um, among the strengths are that we have, you know, tremendous workforce. Um, we have a lot of great technology that we can use. Um, we have just, you know, very dedicated organizations um, as well, and both uh, particularly the health systems, but also many different other kinds of organizations devoted to health. Um, you know, the weaknesses are that we have an inequitable distribution of access to care. We still have a lot of people who are uninsured. Um, and in general, we pay for care in a way that's not really conducive to good health outcomes. We pay mainly fee for service still with some... Um, you know, increasing appreciation for the fact that we could be getting, I think, a lot more health for all the money that we pour into healthcare. Um, I think that the coronavirus pandemic has exposed the fragility of our financing system. You know, the fee for service is great while there's plenty of services to get fees for, but when you have a decline in elective surgeries, elective admissions, people rethinking some of these procedures, 
some of you know that is to their detriment, but some of it may not be to their detriment because we do a lot of things in the United States that aren't really well based in evidence. Um, but you know the the impact on practices on hospitals has just been just profound, and a lot of physicians are facing going out of business. Hospitals are now have negative operating margins, and you know that's a that's a real shock. So it makes people think like. Does it have to be that, you know, all my income is based on the, the number of things that I do? And I hope that that opens the door to some different kinds of models of structuring payment that allows for different kinds of care delivery models. You know, I've been very involved in Maryland, the hospital global budgeting initiatives um, expanded a lot while I was the state health secretary. We pay hospitals in Maryland a global budget for all payers. And that allows hospitals to uh, shift services to where they really need to be, not to be afraid to reduce inpatient um, stays. If, if you know, we can keep people healthy and out of the hospital, then the hospital system benefits from that instead of getting harmed by that, which is a perverse you know, incentive. So um, I think there's going to be more interest in those kinds of models. And I, I hope that we don't just add a whole new raft of fee-for-service for telemedicine, but instead we give some flexibility to the clinical system to restructure care in a way that makes the most sense. Those are really great thoughts, and I you know, definitely have seen how even in the middle of a, a health pandemic, um, so many uh, allied health professionals and whatnot have been furloughed because there just aren't enough um, people coming in to do the uh, elective procedures. Yeah, I read a, a, you know, interesting headline, at least somewhere where they said, you know, the health system is suffering, but health insurers are doing great, <laughs> you know, um, because they're collecting the premium and not having to pay it out. And so, you know, it makes you think like, maybe it does make sense for more of that um, uh, flexibility to be at the clinical level rather than at the insurance level. You know, if, in Maryland, uh, essentially, the, for at least the hospital part, there's much more flexibility for the hospital to shift things around but still get paid. That's interesting. I know at least one auto insurer, I think State Farm, uh, is actually giving refunds on premiums because so few miles are being have been driven over the past two months relative to what it was before. Have you heard of any health insurers kind of offering to do the same? I'm not. I mean, they, they might have to under some of the uh, federal rules, you know, depending. Um, but still, that's not anywhere near the um, potential of benefit, you know, for transforming the healthcare system, I think. But it might be that there, there'll be a little bit of money coming back to, to payers. Got it. Um, well, so speaking on uh, about the pandemic, um, you know, I know you're helping to lead an effort with the state of New York, Resolve to Save Lives and the Bloomberg Philanthropies to train uh, thousands or tens of thousands of contact tracers to help um, fight the spread of COVID-19. I was wondering, can you talk a bit about how that initiative came together and how things are going? Sure. It came together quickly. That's how it came together very quickly. I think, you know, for a while uh, we've been saying that testing is important. But what's really important is doing something with the test results. So just, you know, the metaphysical understanding that someone has a coronavirus infection is, is good, but it's really essential for disease control that that person is able to isolate themselves. And then you can talk to them about who they may have exposed and help those people quarantine themselves. And that is not as easy as just talking to them and telling them what to do. They may need extra resources. They may need support. So that whole process of contact tracing, isolation, and quarantine has been very successful in other countries um, and could really help the process of reopening here in the United States. And, you know, I think as the um, crisis uh, of acute care kind of subsided, people started to say, well, what, what's the next thing for us to do? And they've really focused on contact tracing. I give a lot of credit to Dr. Crystal Watson and the team at the Center for Health Security at Johns Hopkins for really pushing this at the policy level. And then um, we have some fantastic people at the School of Public Health led by Dr. Emily Gurley, who uh, jumped in to say, well, if they're gonna do contact tracing, we better train people well. And so we put together a free course. Dr. Gurley is the lead instructor and, and she assembled a fantastic team that included uh, Tolbert Nienswa, who was the head of the Liberian Ebola response. You know, um, and there's a free course now in the first week, about 150,000 people enrolled and 22,000, I think, passed. Um, New York adopted this curriculum as required for its contact tracers that Governor Cuomo announced 
he'd have about 10,000 contact tracers and there are a number of other places that are using it. So, you know, we're, we're glad to be contributing to the education of contact tracers and we hope that uh, places can establish well-run programs. It's, it's a challenge to do contact tracing with such a fast moving respiratory virus, but, um, but it's, you don't have to be perfect to have an impact on the, on the epidemic curve. Well, well, how does, uh, so once somebody completes the course, like 22,000 people have done it so far, how does one go from completing the course to then actually getting a job as a contact tracer? And how long do you think that'll last? I mean, just given that so many people are unemployed, I'm just curious what those 22,000 people look like so far. Are they people who lost their jobs? Are they health medical students who are looking to do something helpful? It's a mix. It's a, it looks like it's a mix of people. Um, hopefully we'll be able to put out some specific statistics soon, but there's definitely a big chunk of people who are unemployed. Um, our course only requires a high school education. Um, the, uh, there are also people who are students. Um, and then there are other people who may just be checking the course out to just familiarize themselves with contact tracing, not because they're actually going to do it. In New York, it's part of the hiring process. So first you sign up with the New York site, then you get a special link to our course, and then New York knows whether you passed or not, and then you move on in the hiring process. In other places, or just in general, you can go online, take the course, and get a certificate that demonstrates that you passed. Got it. That makes sense. I was actually um, kind of coincidentally on a Zoom call uh, about two weeks ago um, with Mark Cuban, and he had just like earlier that day or, or earlier that weekend said how the the not just state of New York, but how the federal government needs to invest in training hundreds of thousands of contact tracers. Um, I'm curious, have you have you been in touch with his office at all about that? I have not. I have not been in touch with his office, but you know we're. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to do our part, you know, the course is a basic course on contact tracing. And then there's, you know, a lot of operational work that still has to be done within programs to get them to work well. Um, got it. So the other thing I wanted to mention was, um, I read your, um, uh, proposal in JAMA, uh, co-authored with Dr. Howard Bachner about creating a national public health service corps. Uh, using people who would otherwise be in their first year of medical school. I'd love to hear more about that proposal and your thinking behind the idea. Sure. And the idea behind a public health service corps wasn't just limited to medical students. I think we were provocative by saying cancel medical school for a year and just offer all those people a chance to join. But I do support the idea of a service corps, um, and I think it could be impactful even if there's not a pandemic. Um, nursing students, public health students, medical students, you know, uh, as well as uh, others um, could join. There are some service bills that are now in Congress to do something like this. You could use it to staff contact tracing. You could use it for other kinds of um, assistance, connecting people to food assistance and other ne necessities. You could use it to address some of the challenges with social isolation people are experiencing right now. And then even if, uh, you know, there's no pandemic as we pull out of this, you could use it to help control uh, hypertension, diabetes, and some of the, the underlying issues that are causing such really terrible disparities in COVID-19 outcomes. Yeah, I mean, that's a, speaking as a, as a medical student who also took a gap year between college and med school, um, I would pretty, pretty significantly endorse that idea as well. I think it, would, <clears throat> it shows uh, maybe your interest in, before pursuing a career in healthcare um, and maybe gets you some skills that you can actually apply when you're in, in a health professional program. Um, have you received, I know it was a provocative proposal, I'm curious, has the reaction been mostly positive, negative, and, and um, has anything surprised you about the reaction? Well, there are a few medical students who weren't too excited about the idea. They, you know, had to plan for their lives, and this was not part of it. Um, I, I think that we would just reinforce that, you know, this is a voluntary option for people. They wanted to take it as, as we conceived of it. Um, there's also some uh, some people wrote and said, well, you know, you should make um, just three years uh, be enough for medical school. Like, so if people do this and then they do three years of medical school, they could actually graduate on time. It's an interesting idea. I think the medical schools themselves might not be so enthusiastic about that one. Um, so, you know, I think we sparked some some discussion and I really do appreciate that there are some members of Congress who are now pursuing, you know, the idea of a service program and we're quite interested in talking to us about, you know, how this could be structured with medical school and, and other students. Got it. So, so before the coronavirus pandemic, um, obviously we all 
the, the biggest pandemic that was in the news was the opioid epidemic. Um, and I'm, I'm just curious how you see the two intersecting. Um, obviously, it seems obvious that with the healthcare system so overwhelmed right now, uh, we aren't able to provide enough care for those who are dealing with the opioid epidemic. Um, but what are you seeing uh, or hearing right now? So there, there are two types of intersections. Some people are calling this the, uh, the epidemic within the pandemic. Um, we certainly haven't solved the opioid epidemic, and now we've got another pandemic. Uh, one major issue is the difficulty in caring for people with opioid addiction and helping people with opioid addiction in the middle of a pandemic. And so that's required you know, the rapid transformation of a lot of clinical uh, services. So um, some of uh, the programs have been given some flexibility from the federal government. Um, people can prescribe buprenorphine for opioid addiction without a physical exam in person, for example. So that's actually, you know, allows for more rapid starts than you used to be able to do. Uh, buprenorphine being highly effective in reducing mortality among people with opioid addiction. Um, uh, that same flexibility hasn't entirely been granted for methadone, um, and that has created some problems, but there is more flexibility for giving people methadone to take home, so they're not crowds of people at the uh, programs that, that provide methadone, but um, that's still a big challenge for a lot of places. Um, and then you have the challenge of doing harm reduction uh, outreach when you're supposed to be at home, everyone's supposed to be at home. You know, for a long time, the advice has been for people using drugs to use in groups so people can resuscitate each other. But now you're saying don't be in groups because of the risk of COVID. So I think it is, you know, predictable that in some areas overdoses will go up, particularly where there isn't strong access to treatment. In other areas, you know, I, I know there's a really big push to take advantage of the flexibilities of treatment and get treatment out there. And the other you know, interesting thing is I think the trade with, or the, you know, um, incoming fentanyl may be a little bit disrupted from, from China. And so that may actually reduce the lethality of some of the products that are being sold in the United States. We'll have to see how all these different factors in different directions shake out. So that's one part of the equation. The other part of the equation is just in general that um, drug use is, is not good for COVID transmission, I think. Um, you know, not, you know, in part because uh, people have to go out and get drugs on a regular basis. So that, um, you know, means they're talking to people or engaged. They're still people selling drugs on the streets um, when they should be at home isolated. Um, it's also because, um, you know, people may not be using their best judgment if they're under the influence or intoxicated in different ways. So, you know, I think that there's um, a real strong rationale in both directions to, um, you know, to strengthen addiction treatment now and to lean into, you know, flexibility for addiction treatment. One last thought was that people who use drugs often have other chronic illnesses. And so they may be at high risk for serious illness and death. And so, you know, really getting this right um, doesn't just influence the total number of cases, but probably will reduce the overall uh, burden of COVID. Hmm. That's fascinating. That's uh, obviously you've thought a lot about how those two intersect. Um, so the reason we call this uh, interview series Raise the Line is because everyone is familiar with the term flatten the curve. It's why we're supposed to be social distancing to uh, avoid overwhelming the healthcare system. Uh, raising the line is basically just uh, the other part of the equation, we believe, of increasing healthcare capacity, ranging from PPE and ventilators um, to obviously the healthcare workforce, like contact tracers, as you and your team have done uh, and are doing. Uh, I'm curious, what other uh, ideas do you have um, about how we can improve healthcare capacity and raise the line? Well, it's, um, it's a good question. You know, that's, I think um, we have to uh, do better with the supply chain more generally. You know, I think that hospitals are running short of medicines. Um, it's more than just ventilators. It's testing capacity. And I think it, the crisis has exposed a weakness in our supply chain where, you know, pretty much you might be able to say the supply chain is designed to maximize the income of people along the supply chain. And that generally means that there's not a lot of robustness to the supply chain. People aren't sitting on things that they can get rid of and not have to hold extra capacity. So when like it all stops moving, you know, there's not a lot at each stage. 
And then there's sort of a mad scramble to, to get more, which is not that efficient to have hospitals bidding against each other and confusion about who has what. And I think we really have to take a step back and revisit all that if we're going to have a more resilient healthcare system. That's great. That's a great thought. Um, so, you know, I've taken up a lot of your time. I'm curious, are there any other thoughts or comments you'd like to share with our audience um, about your work and about how they can maybe help? Well, I think, um, you know, this is going to be uh, quite a battle against this pandemic. And, you know, everybody who is listening to your podcast, you know, really needs to think about their own role in educating their family, their communities about what this best science is, how we can, you know, be smart about things, and also, uh, you know, be aware of, of different uh, approaches like contact tracing so that people, you know, realize it's not some mysterious activity conducted by covert agents, but it's something that you have people from the health department doing like they do pre-pandemic for different diseases in order to basically find where the virus is and protect people from it and help people protect their loved ones from it. And it's a, it's a completely understandable and sensible activity. And so uh, I think it's really important that people recognize that if somebody calls and, and says you may have been exposed, that's a call to take and to talk over with the health department. Well, that was a great, great thought, uh, closing word. So Dr. Sharfstein, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thanks for having me. So with that, I'm Shiv Ulani. Thanks uh, to our audience for checking out today's show. And remember to do your part to flatten the curve and raise the line. We're all in this together.